Okay, got some fan art for you before we get into the main bulk of the video. So let's say you're building your very first commander deck or you got a pre-con and you're upgrading that, which is probably a lot more likely. I don't think many people are actually building a commander deck from scratch for their very first time. And if you are, like seriously, more power to you, and I respect that, but that's not how I was able to begin, and that's not how most people were able to begin. But if you are starting out, there is one thing that a lot of people skimp on and don't really think a whole lot about, and that is their mana bases. Now you'd think, this is something people would take a little more time and consideration in when sculpting their decks, but oftentimes we tend to just let whatever lands come in the pre-con be what we have. And I know this because I've picked apart a lot of people's pre-cons over the years, or rather I've picked apart their decks and they still have the pre-con mana bases. And you can usually tell if they've got things like uh, this guy right here. This is Thornwood Falls, and I think it has one of the best artworks of any land possible. At least, this one from March of the Machine. However, it's not a good land. It's a really bad land. And you've probably used this, or this, or this, or this, in a lot of your decks before. But uh, let's go over some of the lands you shouldn't be running in your decks, and then let's talk about how to choose lands that you should be running. We're going to start this off simple. Just the, the cards that fix our mana bases is what we are focusing on right now. And in a lot of pre-cons, these are the first things you will find. These are the gain lands. These are a cycle of lands that all come into play tapped and gain you one life when they come into play. And they sound really, really appealing for first-time players because you trade a land coming into play tapped for a little bit of life. That's not that bad, honestly. But the more you play the game, the more you realize that playing a land tapped basically means that you're losing a turn to your opponents. You are always giving up a turn to your opponents. It's, there's no difference between being on turn three and missing a land drop versus being on turn three and playing a tapped land. If you keep playing tapped lands, you're always going to be playing mana a turn behind all of your opponents. So the first lands we got to talk about, these guys right here, you've probably seen them in your pre-cons. If you haven't seen these, there's another set you've probably seen at least in a few, and they are these creature lands here, this first cycle of creature lands. They all come into play tapped as well, and the creatures that they can create are not terribly great with one exception. Uh, Celestial Colonnade can make a 4-4 white blue elemental for five mana. That's not very great. Lumbering Falls can make an elemental creature with hexproof. Uh, it becomes one, rather. And that also isn't very great. Making your land into a creature is a wonderful way to close out a game in a one versus one game of, uh, of Magic the Gathering. But if you are playing a game of Commander, oftentimes these uh, basically French vanilla creatures do not do you any good. The only exception that I would probably say is okay is Creeping Tar Pit. And that's because there's a lot of decks that can make use of the unblockable clause on this particular card. Creeping Tar Pit, uh, tar pit being able to be an unblockable creature means that it's useful for Umazawa decks. It's useful for Yuriko decks. Like there's a few decks that can take this particular card and make it shine. But generally speaking, I do not think that these should be ran in your decks basically at all because the, the benefit you get for these cards coming into play tapped just are are not enough, in my opinion. The next ones are the generic tap lands. These are 10 cards that we don't really see in pre-cons all that much now, but when you got the starter decks recently, uh, recently, it was like a year or two ago, they were chock full of these guys, and I couldn't understand why, because Wizards had plenty of better lands to pick, but these are exactly what I said they are. They are generic come into tapped lands. They have no benefit to coming into play tapped other than uh, you decided that they're here. But there is one land that Wizards absolutely adores putting in pre-cons, and it's as situational as the Creeping Tar Pit for me, and even in the situations where these lands are useful, I still don't like running them. Like, I don't like running them in Galea, for instance, even though she is a top-of-deck manipulation deck, and that is the Temples. 
Now, the temples are a cycle of lands that all come into play tapped, like everything else we're talking about right now, but they have the ability of letting you scry one when they come into play. Now, there is some debate in the commander community over whether these lands are useful. I'm on the side of the debate that scrying one is worth half a mana, and if a land is coming into play tapped, I want its effect to be worth one whole mana for me. And honestly, even in decks that I want to manipulate the top of my deck all the time in, I just don't see enough benefit from the temples to put them in my decks. Even Scrying 2 is a little hard for me to justify off of some of these lands. Unless my deck is like so hyper budget that I am desperately needing these in place of basics just to make sure that my mana curve is fine. But these are chalk in every single pre-con that is made now. And Wizards loves them, and the player base for Magic the Gathering loved them in Standard when they came out, because it turns out in Standard, that scry can be the difference between you winning a game or you getting hit over and over again with dead draws. But in Commander, we've got plenty of options for that, and sometimes we can just wait on the other players at the table to make our life less problematic. So these don't end up being as powerful for us either. The next cycle of cards you've probably seen in a lot of pre-cons, even in like when you, if you got the pain bow pre-con or the slivers pre-con, it was chock full of these little guys. These are the original tri-land cycle. Now I say original, there's two other cycles of tri-lands before these, but one of them had to sacrifice itself to get different colors. And the other one you had to pay like three mana to get all the different colors. So I don't really count those because let's be honest, you didn't even know those existed before I said it, most of you anyway. These lands look appealing at first glance. You'd think that getting access to all of your deck's colors is worth the card coming into play tapped. But if I'm being 100% honest, we even have better options for this that don't come into play tapped. And even on a budget, there are better options for these particular cards. Now, there are more types of cards that I do not suggest you running in a commander deck, but these are the ones that I see most often because these are the ones that Wizards tends to include in pre-cons all the time, and I just think that we can do a lot better than these guys now. And if you want to know exactly how we can do better than that, let's just look at those tri-lands first. In my lands guide, which I will have linked in the description below, I have four different Jund lands, and then I have lands of the Wedge col uh, colorations as well that I think are worth running. Now, there are more cards in the Shard versions. Uh, shards being, if you look at the back of a Magic the Gathering card, the Shard is the three colors that are uh, attached to one another. So green, blue, black, Esper, that's a Shard. But if it is a combination of colors that are opposite of one another, so like green, blue, and red, uh, the red is opposite from the green, uh, not the green, the blue, uh, blue, white, red, wet, rather. Those colors do not all touch. One of them does not. And that makes a shard instead of a, uh, or that makes a wedge instead of a shard instead. But these lands, beginning with the expensive one, Zeotora's Proving Grounds for uh, every single shard and wedge has one of these these lands are worth running. Now, they are expensive, so I would not recommend going out and getting them immediately for most decks, but the reason they're worth running is because they have the type in their uh, in their subtyping. So they have super type land, subtype, swamp, mountain, forest for Zeotora's Proving Grounds. The reason you want this land is you can get it with cards like Nature's Lore, Wood Elves, uh, anything that can grab like a forest or a non-forest out of your deck and put it on the battlefield, it can grab these. Also, if you happen to be playing fetch lands, like actual $10 to $20 fetch lands, they will also grab these. The reason that's important Cards like that allow you to choose when you are getting these cards into the battlefield tapped, as opposed to having to draw them like normal and then play them as your land per turn, putting you behind on uh, against other players. These lands also have cycling, which makes them worthwhile in my, like any land that has cycling is automatically worthwhile in my book. 
because lands that have cycling when you are mana flooded in a game can be replaced by other live cards in your deck by just cracking them away then we have the suicide land cycle i want the i want wizards to complete these but these are the lands that come into battlefield automatically sacrifice themselves and gain you a life and then they get you a swamp mountain or forest out of the deck i like these more than other uh, lands that come into play tapped because these give you the life gain from the gain lands and a deck shuffle, which is far more important to me in a ton of decks than anything else. There's lots of times where we play cards like Brainstorm, where we put dead cards on the top of our deck, and instead of drawing them, we can drop one of these on the board and just shuffle our deck. Like, lands that make us shuffle our deck are good, because there's so many ways to make use of that. Speaking of that, Panoramas are another way in three color decks for you to get a huge benefit benefit from deck shuffles so these uniquely come into play untapped which makes them very very good to begin with and because they tap for colorless mana if we need them to filter into one of our colors then yes we have to pay two mana the original land and then one extra mana on top of that in order to get the land that we want but it's that flexibility that ability to go hey i need this to be a land right now that taps for things right now so i can and then if i need this to be a deck shuffle it can be that if i need this to be a particular land type it can be that finally layers i think that there are plenty of use cases for layers as well because it turns out any land that bounces another land to your hand is incredibly useful because cards like bajooka bog exist where is i have bajooka bog in here aha there it is so cards like bajooka bog exist and Bajooka Bog has an ability where it enters the battlefield tapped, but it just yeets somebody's graveyard away. I think that's a super powerful ability, and it's very unique to the card. Anybody who's played a few weeks of Commander knows what Bajooka Bog is. Any of these lands that do a thing when they come into the battlefield, cards that throw them up into your hand, any bounce land, is automatically going to look at this card and go, oh! I can use this ability more than once. This is a perfect representation of this ability. The ability to just throw something into your hand and get benefit from it multiple times. Also, there are decks like Landfall decks that really want to see their lands bounce up and again because they want to hit their land drops multiple times per turn, and bounce lands can help facilitate that in a variety of ways. Uh, but there is one other type of uh, land you want to run in tricolor decks that I am perfectly okay with and they are the fetching style lands of shire terrace and promising veins now obviously fetching lands like myriad landscape evolving wilds all those are also good but these specifically are panoramas wizards instead of completing the cycle of panoramas decided to just power create the panoramas by giving a shire terrace and promising vein basically in almost back-to-back -back sets these were both released in the same year they come into play untapped. They give us colorless mana, just like the panoramas. But unlike the panoramas, they can give us one of any basic land out of our deck instead of being limited to whatever basic lands are listed on the cards themselves. They are phenomenal lands. And if you notice, in basically every budget build that I make, I tend to toss one of these in. They are fantastic lands, and I think more people should be running them because they come into play untapped. They do everything that you want a land to do being untapped, and they also give you the ability to do those deck shuffles and everything else. The last kind of land that I think that in multicolor decks you should be running, I mentioned before, fetching lands. Now, obviously, fetch lands like Marsh Flats, Windswept Heath, and Scalding Tarn are great, but look at the prices on these. $20, $20, $15, $15, $15. Like, those lands are super expensive. You have budget options. Frozen Verge can get both a forest and a plains from your deck, and they can get typed ones. So these can get the triomes, these can get searchable duels, these can get anything out of your deck, basically. And it gets two of them, so it ramps you as well. Ash Barons can fetch any basic by just cycling it out of your hand. Evolving Wilds, Terramorphic Expanse, and Escape Tunnel are all lands that can get a land out of your deck. Now, I don't like running these in every deck unless it's very, very hyper budget, but in any kind of landfall strategy or in any deck like Galea that wants to see deck shuffles a lot, 
these will do a ton of work and then of course cards like myriad landscape just it's a it's a ramping land just like crows and verge but it does not get typed duels but let's say that you are running a dual color deck or even a tri-color deck and you're trying to figure out which dual color lands you want to run well in that case i have an 18 card list that you should be running for every single one of these like these this lands guide has all these lands sorted for you, and these are all ones that I think are worth running for various reasons. Beginning with filter lands. Sungrass Prairie is a filter land. It can get you the land types that you need. A lot of people don't like these Odyssey style filters, but I've done a video on them, and my, my reasoning for liking them is they filter any type of mana you throw into them. So if you have a color you don't need, or if you have a colorless color that's coming out of like a Mind Stone, Sungrass Prairie works really well for filtering that. These are reveal lands. Fortified Village is a reveal land. These are the lands that let you reveal a land of a type in your hand. They can reveal dual lands out of your hand, like Radiant Grove, or just a basic land so they come into play untapped. I don't think these are worth it to run in most tricolor decks or high because it's harder to guarantee that you have those typed lands because those decks you can't afford to have as many basics in them and if you're running on a budget you can't have as many uh typed lands in there anyway like you can't run duels you probably aren't running shock lands but these are still great in two colored decks scattered grove is what we call a bicycle land and it is one of many lands that have land typing on them all lands that have land typing on them are worth running not only do the bicycle lands have the ability to cycle themselves away but they come with the added bonus of being able to be grabbed with cards like wood elves and nature's lore etc and remember those cards are great with these because they allow you to do mana fixing while also being able to grab these out of the deck these can be grabbed with fetch lands as well these are fantastic lands even though they come into the battlefield tapped the trade-off you get is the flexibility while they are in the 99 of your deck these cards are okay in the hand because they can be seen with cards like fortified village but they are fantastic while in the deck and then there are dual colored bounce lands i mentioned Celez uh, i mentioned bounce lands before they are fantastic at being able to recycle different things you have if you have mdfc lands uh, these work really well for them as well i'll do an entire video on mdfcs and why they're useful uh, later on down the road but selesnia sanctuary cards like these that bounce any land you control to your hand let you reuse cards like bajuka bog they allow you to uh, reuse mdfcs that you dropped onto the table earlier they are fantastic then there are the new creature lands the restless lands now, each and every one of these has a very, very niche scenario they need to be used in, but like Restless Prairie, whenever the creature land of Restless Prairie attacks, it gives a 1-1 one, one to all the creatures you have on the board. In a token strategy, that's a pretty good mana dump just from the back of your land base, being able to go, I don't have a spell that doesn't overrun effect, but I have a mini lording effect in my lands that I can use. That's not a bad effect to have access to in the land base. Then there's cards like Restless Cottage as well. If I go to the the Golgari lands real quick. Restless Cottage has another very good effect that you can utilize here. If I can just go and boop, here it is. So Restless Cottage also has the ability to, uh, whenever it attacks, you can create a food token, which is good for decks that care about tokens, and you get to exile any card from any graveyard. That's an immensely powerful effect to have access to for just about any deck. Then, after we have these creature style lands that we have access to, we also have another style of land to get into, and they are the Tango lands. So uh, Canopy Vista, if we go ahead and go boo, 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 control F Tango lands, because I have the ability to do that now. I can just go and hit this button. There we go. So these are the Tango Lands, Prairie Stream, Canopy Vista, Cinderglade, Smoldering Marsh, and Sunken Hollow. They are fantastic because they can come into play untapped, which is the hallmark of damn near any land that I talk about. Why am I having issues finding Selesnia lands to go back to where we were? I guess it's just because select is a thing. 
<laughs> it's a useful guide, but it has some quirks sometimes. Uh, but the Tango lands are wonderful because they come into play untapped nine times out of ten, and of course, they are typed, so they are fetchable. Unfortunately, though, we only have the allied cycle of lands for these cards. We do not have enemy cycles, so we have, you know, we have green-white, we have white-blue, we have blue-black, we have black-red, and then we have red-green, but we do not have, say, Golgari. We don't have a Tango land in green and black, but hopefully with wizards completing more cycles of lands, we will actually see these. And then we have cards like Sun Petal Grove. These are our check lands. Check lands look for a land of a type on the battlefield, and then they see if they can be untapped when they come into the battlefield. These are fantastic to run. I adore these guys. Uh, the only decks I don't like them in is like landfall decks that really want cards to have land typings. Then we have Razor Verge Thicket. I think these lands are useful in decks that are very, very speedy as a one or two of. If you are running a deck that only has like 31, 32 lands, maybe in CDH, you can find a use for these untapped lands because they come into play untapped only when you have two or fewer lands they are very very finicky but i don't think they are the worst lands to be running there are better options however like these slow lands especially in casual commander overgrown farmland enters the battlefield tapped unless you have two or more other lands that is a very very easy thing to fulfill we're usually just going to hold on to this in our hand. We shouldn't be keeping hands that only have two lands anyway. So in any hand that is worth keeping, we already have fulfilled the ability to use cards like Overgrown Farmland. Then we have the Pathway Lands. These are lands that can flip into one of each type of land that you need. These are wonderful. The only side effect of them if, is if you're running a deck that's very pip-heavy. Think cards like niv Perune Perun that have like you know three of each pip you need to be careful because if you play these early, you may end up drawing basic lands in the land types that you are clogging on and then be unable to play those very restrictively pipped cards. So just make sure that you're selecting wisely with these and play them later rather than earlier if you have the ability to play basic lands so you have an idea of what you're going to be drawing. Uh, then we have pain lands. I love pain lands. They can tap for colorless or you can tap them for the colors that they are associated with, and then they deal one damage to you. Just very, very straightforward, very, very good. Then we have the filters, what people tend to call good filters. These filter lands can either be colorless or they can filter uh, the land types associated with it or the mana types associated with it into any combination of its mana types. A lot of people tend to think these are better than the Odyssey filters. I think they're about as good as the Odyssey filters because they fill a different niche, but I've done an entire video on that. Then, of course, we have the new lands that just came out of Markov Karlov Manor. The dual typed surveil lands once again lands that have dual typing are wonderful because they are fetchable and we can do tons of things with them but most notably they are power creeps of the temples because unlike the temples which gave us scry these give us surveil and surveil in my opinion is a much more powerful effect than scry because i tend to favor a lot of decks that like reanimation or send from deck to graveyard triggers cards that use cards like uh, dreadhound or sir conrad the grim or uh you know sephiris all of these decks really love seeing the surveil trigger here it does a ton of work for them and the ability to do it off of fetching is just fantastic then we have the battle bond lands these end of the battlefield tapped unless you have two or more opponents. If you're playing a game of Commander, you've probably already fulfilled the need uh, for these particular cards. Horizon lands. These are the lands that allow you to sacrifice them to draw a card later in the game. I think they're great. Uh, there are people who don't like paying the life for them, but I'm going to be honest. As long as these are not the first lands you play in a game, that life pay is not going to hurt you that terribly much. Uh, Temple Garden. These are the shock lands. Shock lands are also fantastic to run because you can pay two life, make them come to play untapped. And they are, of course, cards that are... Wow, my brain my brain just stopped. They are fetchable. That's what I was trying to say. They are fetchable lands that are untapped, and that makes them very, very helpful. Now, in other colors, there are some extra things that you have access to. If you have any deck that is colored black, you have access to the tainted lands, these are lands that can give you both your mana types, so long as you have a swamp. As long as you've got a well-sculpted mana package, you can almost always make sure that the tainted lands do what you need them to do. They're just 
fantastic at being dual colored lands and they give you colorless land mana if you need them to tainted lands are also one of the reasons that i really think it's a good idea for people to use those new uh, odyssey filters because the odyssey filters can take a tainted land that does not yet see its uh color that it needs and can just filter it into the colors that it needs automatically. So if we are looking at, where is it, Shadow Blood Ridge, if you've got Shadow Blood Ridge and you've got Tainted Peak out, you can just tap the Tainted Peak and filter its mana into the Shadow Blood Ridge while you are waiting to draw a Swamp. That's a perfectly reasonable play you have access to. Also, keep note, there are some uh, lands that have very specific... Uh, land, so there are some land colors that have specific land types to them that other cycles do not have. So like in black, black has an extra pain land. Black has Mount Doom. Uh, black doesn't get a horizon land as far as I know, but it does get Mount Doom, which is a wonderful pain land. Let me actually just check and make sure that there is not a horizon land in black because there might not be. There might actually not be a horizon land for black. No. No, Rakdos does not have Horizon Lands. Horizon Lands are in Simic. They are in uh, Is it? They are in multiple colors. They are in Boros, Orzov, Selesnia, and Golgari. So they're in all of the enemy colors and then one allied color, the original Horizon Canopy. And that's basically it. So these are all fantastic lands that you can use in your decks. And I think that if you are running a two colored deck, you should be using these. But there is one other type of land that you might wanna run in a two colored deck that doesn't need its own video, that is just very, very easy to talk about. And that is gates. So there are some decks that use gate bases and I'm gonna be perfectly honest, I adore gate mana bases. So what are gates? Well, originally they were a cycle of lands uh, that said land, gate, and they all came into play tapped and they were all associated with each one of the Ravnica guilds. And that was enough and that was fine until we got Baldur's Gate giving us access to more cards with gate. Now, granted, uh, War of the Spark gave us, you know, Gateway Plaza. So we had <clears throat> some other cards as well that had gate typing, but the majority of our new gate support came from Baldur's Gate. That is Heap Gate, uh, Cliff Gate, Manor Gate, Black Dragon Gate, Gone Gate, Citadel Gate, Sea Gate, and Baldur's Gate being the main ones. Dominaria gave us Thran Portal, and then uh, the Black Gate was given to us in the Lord of the Rings uh, cards that came out as well. We also have Plaza of Harmony from one of the original or one of the older Ravnica sets, but aside from the gates that are associated with all of the guilds, uh, Gateway Plaza can tap for any mana of any color. You basically only want it to be there so it can be another uh, gate for you to get a Maze's End win. Uh, I have not put Maze's End wins in any of the decks that I've built on this channel yet uh, because I don't find Maze's End to be a very interesting way to win. Uh, when you play gates, everybody just kind of expects you're going to play Maze's End. and It's kind of boring to just go, yeah, I guess I have to hold my beast within for that one guy. But... If you want to play Maze's End, it is a way to chuck a win con in a deck that might otherwise struggle with it. Maze's End can pop into your hand and get a gate out of your library and put onto the battlefield. And if you have 10 or more gates after that point, and they all have different names, then you win the game. Uh, also, Baldur's Gate is another gate payoff. You can add X mana of any color where X is the number of gates you control. Because there are, you know, like 23 gates that have gate typing in them, Baldur's Gate can get you a fuck ton of mana. The Omnath five color deck and the uh, Niv-Mizet five color deck that I built on this channel make a ton of mana with Baldur's Gate. They do, this card does a ton of work. Uh, but the reason that the gates base works for me is not only is there a lot of cards that will give you gates to your hand. Uh, let me go ahead and pop over to my Mothman deck, which I've already talked about before, but I have the gate fetch package in the considering section of my Mothman deck, and that should have... Where is it? Ah, so you get in the gate space, you have cards like Circuitous Route, Explore the Underdark, which gets two gates onto the battlefield tapped uh, and gives you other benefits as well. You also gain access to Navigation Orb, District Guide, Open the Gates, and Gatekeeper Vine, which can specifically grab gates out of your deck. And then, of course, if you're in the colors for it, Nine Fingers Keen is a wonderful way to pay off your gates as well, because if you've got uh, enough gates on the board, she just becomes an instant draw many cards card. 
So those are some of your benefits for playing Gates. But the main strategy with Gates is to get Gone Gate out as fast as possible. If you can get Gone Gate out in the first two or three turns, your Gates mana base, which is a budget mana base, feels like a non-budget mana base from this point on, because Gone Gate makes all of your Gates come into play untapped. So Black Dragon Gate, which lets you select mana of any color, is now an Omni land that comes into play untapped. Uh, Baldur's Gate, which gets you tons of mana, now comes into play untapped. Maze's End is not a gate, so ha! Get screwed, nerd. Uh, but cards like Baldur's Gate, Thran Portal, Gone Gate, uh, Citadel Gate, all of these are made way stronger when you look at Gone Gate making these lands come to play untapped. If you're playing a Wooberg deck and you're doing it on a budget, Wooberg being one of every mana type, then I would highly suggest you try running a gate space. It is going to be your easiest, smoothest way of making a five color mana base work in budget. However, you do have to dedicate those extra cards to it. You do want to make sure you've got access to Open the Gates, District Guide, Nav Orb, Gate Creeper Vine, Circuitous Root, and Explore the Underdark. But if you're using a Gates base, you can just Voltron win with Guild Glaive of the Guild Pact. That's a funny way to close out games. I've I built the Niv-Mizzet deck I did a video on in physical, and Glaive of the Guild Pack being a way to just close out people's noggins is hilarious. Like, yes, I'm a Spellslinger deck, but also my dragons got a sword. <laughs> but I'd say that those are all the worthwhile style of lands you can run in various color combinations. They are your bounce lands, your layers, your triomes, all of your different dual colored lands of various varieties and flavors. And remember, each land, each set has its own special, unique lands that can be ran. Like if you're in green, red, remember you've got access to Grove of the uh, of the Burn Willows, which is just a land that doesn't hurt you at all while being a dual-colored land. It's a fantastic land. If you're in white-blue, you have access to Nimbus Maze, which is another wonderful land that lets you get white and blue based on various criteria and comes into play untapped. And then finally, there's one other type of land that we got to talk about, and they are the Omni lands. Lands that come into play and do any land type for various reasons. And it, obviously, we have to start with Command Tower. Like, Command Tower is your quintessential, this can be any mana color of anything that I need. But there's other things besides Command Tower you gotta talk about. Like, Crumbling Vistage. Uh, this is a card that I ran in Popper, and I ran it in uh, Popper Bogles, and it's wonderful there, but it's also good in Commander. It enters the battlefield tapped, but when it enters the battlefield, add a mana of any color to your mana pool, and then it becomes a, a blank, uh, colorless mana after that. Crumbling Vestige will give you mana that you need if you are in a, a hyper-budget deck that is Wooberg and you need access to mana pip. Like, let's say you just need to cast a Rampant Growth now and you don't have a green mana source, Crumbling Vestige can be your green mana source. Path of Ancestry comes into play tapped, but if you uh, play any card that is part of the Kindred type with your commander, like an elf or an elf commander, then you get to scry one with it, which is just amazing. Spire of Industry is a pain land so long as you've got artifacts. Exotic Orchard is any land type so long as you've got uh, so long as you've got opponents that have the land type you need. Uh, Secluded courtyard and unclaimed territory are good in typled decks because they will guarantee that you get the land type that you need as long as you've got the creatures that you need uh in your hand so like you know you say i call elves i'm playing an elf deck unclaimed territory is now any color as long as it's giving me an elf survivors encampment is also good it comes into play untapped and you can tap any creature you control to filter it into mana but otherwise it's colorless mana that's still a fantastic card to use in any type of go wide strategy that might hurt for a particular mana type. Aether Hub is basically crumbling vestige again, but it gives you an energy counter to use to turn into a uh, mana of any type whenever you choose. That's huge. And you can do that at any point. So you can let the Aether Hub sit there and be a colorless mana until that one turn comes up where you're like, man, I really wish I had another green. It's perfect for that. Pillar of the Peroons, if you are casting mostly color, uh, multicolored spells, Pillar of the Peroons is perfect for that. It will always be one of the colors of mana you need for your commander, and it will always be there for playing, like if you're playing a Niv-Mizzet deck or a Omnath deck, a deck that cares about cards being multicolors all the time, 
This land will do you a ton of good. Tendo Ice Bridge comes into play with a charge counter on it. And of course, it's the same thing as Aether Hub. It can be any mana of any color, so long as you remove the charge counter from it. But you can also play this in a deck that uses Proliferate so that you can get more charge counters so that it will always be the land color that you need. Glimmer Void is just Spire of Industry again. It is one mana of any color, so long as you have an artifact on the board. If you have no artifacts, it'll, you know, kill itself, but it's still perfectly serviceable in the decks that can use it. Plaza of Heroes is a fantastic land that can be any mana of any type, as long as it's being used to cast basically a commander, and it can be added for any mana as long as you've got a legendary creature out that has mana uh, pips associated with it. You can also exile this to make sure that a creature that you have that's legendary Legendary has protection. Like, this is really, really good in decks that have uh, build around commanders that are susceptible to being killed. Forbidden Orchard is another fantastic Omni land you have access to that will give somebody a color of the spirit, but will give you a ton of mana otherwise. Lotus Field is wonderful in any type of landfall strategy that wants to get lands in and out of the graveyard. It gives three mana of any color. The World Tree. If you're running a Wooberg deck, you probably should put a World Tree in it anyway, because it's once you have six or more lands, all lands you control basically have the Chromatic Lantern effect. City of Brass is an Omni Pain land, which is just great. Lotus Veil is the older version of Lotus Field. You just have to sack two untapped lands, and then you get access to the Lotus Veil. Nykthos is the same thing that you got with Baldur's Gate. Uh, choose a color, add mana to your mana pool uh, based on the devotion you have to that color. If you're playing a monocolored deck, it probably wants a Nykthos. Cavern of Souls is less expensive now than it used to be. Still 35 bucks is high up there, but it's the same thing as Unclaimed Territory, but it makes whatever you call uh, immune to counter spells. And then finally, Mana Confluence is just expensive City of Brass. If you have access to only $10, get City of Brass, though. Like, that Mana Confluence is, is... It costs four times as much, and I don't think it's four times as good as City of Brass. But those are all the Omni lands that I think are worthwhile. Now, obviously, there are others in the game as well, and if I've missed anything, let me know in the comment section below. But I believe that those are in various color combinations probably everything you want to be running in your commander decks. Now, like I said in my lands video, if you are using my lands guide, please make sure that you are uh, enabling tags. If you don't enable tags, this will just be one giant list of nothing. If you hit disable tags, uh, you get this instead and this is madness this will tell you nothing this is not information i have spent a lot of time curating it so please hit enable tags and if you're trying to build a budget deck or you're trying to find stuff within a certain price range just go to sort by go to group by type and tag go to sort by price hit save and then you will see everything sorted here. So you can go, oh, I'm running an Azorius deck. I guess I can put Chancery, Irrigated Farmland, Port Town, all the way up to probably Glacial Fortress in a dual color deck, or even a deck that's multicolor, and it won't break my bank. I'll be spending a whole dollar on like 10 different dual type lands. And unlike the lands in the bad land section, they aren't gonna come into play tapped and hurt me for just existing. Also, um, please don't run Temple of the False God unless your deck has a really damn good reason for running it. That, that's all. Anyways, I hope this was helpful for all of y'all. Let me know in the comment section below uh, if there are lands that are missing from my list and that if I should add them in. Uh, and past that, thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. And as always, everybody, insert end of video tagline here. Hey, I just quickly want to give a thank you to all of my wonderful patrons who keep this show running. YouTube and Twitch are a pretty bumpy ride at the best of times, and the stability a Patreon provides me is worth more than I can say here. I'd also like to thank each and every one of my $20 and up patrons here, and they would be Red Joker, Britzkrieg, Cameron, Dren, Gemshin, Smiling DM, Poundini, Nabity Babity, Naomi, Isaac, Agamotto, Jordan, Ravi, Juni, Kiratorian, Prisma, all of you. Sagitta, I'm not saying that part. And Starlight. And finally, thank you to everyone else that helps keep this channel alive. While you're here, why not check out another video? And thank you for watching.